Welcome to the Terrible Podcast with your host from SteelersDepot.com, where you can find all your latest and greatest Steelers news. It's Dave Bryan and Alex Kazora, always lit, talking Steelers. And now, here's Dave and Alex. Welcome to the Terrible Podcast, Season 12, Episode Number 17. He's Dave Bryan. I'm Alex Kazora, SteelersDepot.com. Welcome back to this Wednesday show, September 1st. So it's the new month and a new roster for the Pittsburgh Steelers, new initial 53-man roster. So their cutdowns, like the rest of the league, were yesterday at 4 p.m. Again, things are fluid. Things can and will change. Dave and I will talk about it. But Dave, a 53-man roster to discuss, and we have a whole lot to discuss. We certainly do. We better discuss this 53 before it changes, (laughs) because I certainly will. But I I think a few surprises uh, uh, involved in over there, more with, uh, I guess, roster construction and probably a a few clues of maybe uh, what's coming and why it was set that way. But uh, uh, you know what? Looking at it overall and then looking back at our our, our roster predictions and all, I I think we did a pretty good job of – uh, uh, coming relatively close on this thing, especially on the 53. We'll obviously see how the the, uh, the practice squad uh, plays out here in the uh, in probably the next 48 hours or so. But uh, uh, yeah, I, I I feel like we had a pretty good grasp on this thing overall. Yeah, I think so too. Um, definitely some surprises, but there always are. This thing's never exactly how you play it out in your head. So. Let's do this, Dave. Let's just kind of go through and go through things as we would do, you know, when we do our predictions and just kind of go through position by position who they actually kept currently and uh, evaluate it from there. So let's start with quarterback and pretty chalk. No surprises there. They're keeping three. It's Ben. It's Mason Rudolph and it's Dwayne Haskins. Josh Dobbs still placed on IR, and because he was not kept on the initial fifty-three, he will not be eligible to be a return um, guy the way that maybe you know some other guys would be if they were initially kept on the uh, first fifty-three. Yeah, and uh, obviously yesterday already some mi- mi- misinformation floating around on, on that. Uh, the fact that he went to IR as part of these moves, uh, as you stated, means that uh, he is not eligible to be a player eligible to return uh, from IR. The other uh, thing related to that that I that I wanted to double check on was, uh, does you know. It, did the contract that he signed have a split salary in it uh, uh, based on, you know, uh, it, you know, in other words, it, it, is it a split uh, lower salary for him if he goes to IR? A lot of times you don't see that with vested players with four, you know, with, with over four crude seasons, and that indeed was not the case with him. So it's a full salary. In other words, he just goes from the uh, active roster to the, uh, or, or from the you know, 80-man roster to the 50, to the uh, IR and he still counts against the salary cap now because the rule of 51 is now over with. So uh, IR uh, charges now count against the salary cap. And the other thing that uh, there was some misinformation about is his salary is not guaranteed. You have to be on the 53-man roster as a vested player uh, uh, to to have your salary guaranteed. He is not. So uh, he obviously suffered, I don't know what, what, what he called it, a turf toe injury, I think, the yeah. Uh, the other night there in the preseason finale kind of wondered what was going to happen with him because we both uh, I think agreed that he wasn't going to make the roster here uh, and he indeed went to IR now how long will he stay there probably until he just until he gets better you know uh, right. and 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 one would hope that it's not a serious injury with him with that toe three four weeks or so don't be surprised if you know, three or four weeks from now, they just release him outright from uh, IR. And if that's the case, then he will be eligible, you know, to, to, to re-sign at some point, you know, uh, or, or sign with another team there. So uh, uh, he definitely will not return to the Steelers uh, roster as long as he is uh, on IR, once again, because he was not on the 53 come come uh, week one of uh, the season there. Right, yeah, good explanation there. So um, do you think this guy really ever comes back to the roster or the practice squad in any sort of way, even if he gets released to the settlement? I think he's probably a guy itching to get his way out of Pittsburgh. 
Uh, probably at this point. I mean, at least he's getting a couple of paychecks here now, right? right. Uh, right. Because uh, had he had he just been cut out, right? People say, well, what, what, what's what's the uh, what's there to gain? Well, you just can't cut a player that's injured this time of year. You know, mm-hmm. uh, uh, now you can wait, you know, obviously play, players get waived injured because that's part of the process there. And, and if they're not uh, picked up off waivers, they revert to the team's uh, uh, injured reserve list. Uh, you just cannot cut players without, you know, some sort of, you know, and just cut him off completely there. So that's why a player like him who's injured, who is vested, uh, has to go to IR first. And then, you know, could they work out some settle, some sort of settlement with him? I, I, I suppose. But, I mean, you're talking about a guy that's on a full salary anyway and not, uh, not, not on a split salary or anything like that. So the best thing is to just go ahead and let him heal. Uh, 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 under your care and supervision, they're on IR there. So uh, that that that's a minutia related to that. Mm-hmm. All right, let's flip to running back now, and they end up keeping four. I know there was a lot of debate in my head: would they keep three? Would they keep four? If they kept just three, who would that third guy be? Ultimately, for now, keeping four. That is Najee Harris, Anthony McFarland, Benny Snell, and Kalen Blige. So again, we'll see if those four make it to Buffalo, but those are the four right now. Well, 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 somebody, uh, a few people owe us apologies, don't they? (laughs) Uh, They do? Yeah, yeah, a lot of people are honest for predicting that Benny Snell would be on his 53-man roster. You know, okay. thinking that we're crazy to think that, you know, guy, you know, that 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 would happen. Uh, uh, I, I really thought that, the, you know, pretty much all along that it was a good chance. But even if this team was to keep just three running backs plus a fullback, uh, I thought Benny, Benny Stell was the better choice there. Uh, and, and look, you talk about attrition during the season at the running back position. You got one extra game now. Who knows what's going on with Anthony McFarlane Jr. now as well. They left him back in Pittsburgh. Uh, during that preseason finale for some sort of treatment there. So, uh, uh, I mean, we took, believe it or not, you know, got, got a lot of grief for, I think on, on the YouTube channel and, and via email for predicting that, that Benny Snell would stick around. So had, will he stick around much longer? We'll obviously see, but one would think mm-hmm. he made it, uh, made it this far that, uh, that, you know, there, you know, there's a good chance he's going to be around yeah. for a little while. Yeah, just getting healthy and I think playing, you know, relatively speaking, good enough in that finale against Carolina was big for him. And I think Bellage overall had a nice summer and to me outplayed Snell, but uh, I think both bring similar value and, you know, definitely some value on special teams. Snell probably a bit more than Bellage. And so for those reasons, Snell on special teams, Bellage as a, as a runner, do it all kind of player probably gets the, the helmet for that reason. And we'll, and we'll see which one dresses, you know, uh, assuming mm-hmm. uh, assuming all four of these guys stay on this 53, you know, up until at least a week one game. Be interesting to see if, 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 if all of them dress or not. Right, they certainly could. Fullback as well, Derek Watt being kept. No surprise there and no major surprises at wide receiver. The five that we predicted for basically the entire summer, Juju Smith-Schuster, Deontay Johnson, Chase Claypool, James Washington, and Ray Ray McLeod. We'll just see. Who gets signed to the practice squad? I think according to ESPN the other day, the expectation was Rico Bussey Jr., the rookie from Hawaii, will sign to the practice squad. But we'll see what things look like uh, this afternoon. Yeah, you'd hope that maybe at least two wide receivers on mm-hmm. the uh, on the practice squad. So I don't know if they'll have that set by you know uh, after after guys clear waivers uh, this afternoon here. Uh, I, they're they're pretty quick at turning that around, aren't they? Within the first yeah. twenty four hours, usually by probably by four p.m. tonight, we'll we'll know what the practice squad All looks right. like. All right, good. Um, so those are the five there. No surprises, tight end. Um, no major surprises either. Certainly, there was some debate about Gentry versus Kevin Rader, but we both kind of gravitated towards Gentry the last you know week or two. So the three they're keeping are Eric Ebron, Pat Frymuth, and Zach Gentry. First two a locks. So it was just a matter of Gentry or Rader in. The way that Gentry had consistently played ahead of Raider in preseason action kind of clued you in that he was going to be the guy. Yeah, had uh, had we not had the snaps or, or or the preseason games to go by, I probably would have stuck with uh, with, with, with 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 Kevin Raider on, on my prediction mm-hmm. there. But I think it was fairly evident, you know, throughout those last two preseason games at the order and you know, as we stated. <laughs> Gentry made some improvements as a blocker, and and that's one of the main things that you really wanted to see going into this offseason, and, and I thought he did it. Now, once again, uh, is he going to dress, you know, uh, right out of the shoot? We'll see. Will he be much of a, uh asset on special teams? If he does dress, we'll see. 
Yeah, I'm still not convinced he will dress. They didn't have him as they did not have him as an active player to start last season. So with Derek Watt there, I mean, I could see Gentry being inactive, but uh, they keep three tight ends, and he was number three. All right, Dave. So th- from from this group we just talked about, it's pretty chalk. No really eyebrow raising selections here. I think we nailed all these players so far. Offensive line gets a little interesting though, keeping currently just eight, four tackles and four interior offensive linemen. The four tackles are Chuck Wuma core for Zach Banner, Dan Moore Jr., and Joe Haig. The interior guys are Kevin Dodson, Kendra Green, Trey Turner, and J.C. Hodson hour. So I think we both expect movement here where they're going to add somebody. They're not going to roll into the season with just eight. Um, but the notable cuts right now are B.J. Finney and Rashad Carrot. I think we had figured that one of those guys wasn't probably going to make the team, but both of those guys not making the team is to me the first minor surprise of these roster moves. Yeah, are you a bill? Do you have the ability to play both left and right guard? Alec? Do you sw- <laughs> do you swing well? I'm, I'm being. I, I'm just good at left guard right now. Working okay. Right well, guard. I'm gonna have to have you work on your position okay. flexibility here. Uh, at least uh, for for the next few hours, we'll see what happens here. Uh, I I feel good in the aspect of this more than anything that we were able to to discern throughout the preseason here that you know Rashad Coward at least for now, uh, didn't at least didn't look like he deserved to be on the 53-man roster. And I think the rotation showed us that uh, as well, too, in the final couple of preseason games uh, as well. Uh, I, I obviously wasn't shocked that he didn't make it. However, comma, <laughs> Finney, Finney didn't either. And you kind of thought one of those two guys, who's your swing? I mean, J.C. Hossenhauer is standing around in that room right now. Uh you know, not much depth in the interior portion, uh, 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 you know, when, when it comes to the offensive line group there. So, yeah, the fact that they kept eight, is this a going to be one of those do dos that we see where a guy goes off to allow right. another guy to go to IR and then he comes back? There's poss- It's a very good possibility. I would think that that player would be B.J. Finney if that mm-hmm. was if if that was to happen, uh, judging by what we've uh, what we've seen so far. Uh, could it be somebody from the outside? Could it be someone coming back to the you know someone like Finney plus someone from the outside? I think that's a, I think that's a possibility as well too. I mean. Uh, it goes without saying, though, this team will not go into week one with just eight offensive linemen on their on their 53-man roster. So mm-hmm. something's going to happen, and I would think the most obvious, at least the way it looks like right now, would be Finney coming back. But I don't think he can rule out maybe that and another player or just another player from the outside. Sure, I think. All those things are possible, and, and something's going to happen here. There will be movement here. I think, yeah, Finney circling back is very much a possibility. If it's the Fontua to Marcus Allen goes to IR, we'll talk about that here in a moment, or um, some waiver wire option. We'll kind of discuss that a little bit later after we, we review the rest of the roster. But, uh, yeah, that was definitely the, the surprise. And now Finney was just okay this summer. I, and I, I mean, I had him off my 53 at some points during this process just because, I mean, I figured he was the veteran stop gap option that was brought in, you know, in case they didn't draft a center high or whatever the, the situation was. But, um, you know, he can't play all three interior spots. I think he's a better guard than J.C. Haas an hour. And so um, I think they got to bring somebody back to give them some some better guard depth. Uh, look, I'm not going to put uh, I'm not going to vote B.J. Finney to the Pro Bowl, but uh, I thought he was the better of the two when it comes to him and Cower Coward. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, you know, I have said this all along. I think they've got to do. I, I think they've got to uh, uh, in, in, in increase the quality of that backup center position, man. Uh, I, you, you, I, I, I take it that you feel a little bit better about J.C. Haas and Howard maybe than I do at, at the center position. But uh, if there's somebody out there, and we'll obviously talk about some names here in a little bit uh, that that could come in, I, I really think that they should look at this thing at the cuts and all like that and see if they can upgrade that, mm-hmm. that center position uh, with a guy to back up uh, uh, Kendrick green. And maybe that player can also give you some, some, you know, swing ability on, on top of it. The fact that BJ Finney did Finney even play any snaps at center during the preseason during uh, actual games. Yeah. I don't think so. He did it in camp. I, it wasn't his primary spot. Um, we can check the charting here from Tom Mead if you'd like. I, I want to say no to that, but I'm not 100% sure. I want to say no as well, too. I think LeGlue had uh, uh, was the guy to follow in 
uh, uh, J.C. Hosnauer, and that makes you kind of wonder, man, if they, it, you know, you would think that the Steelers obviously know that that uh, guard is the better position for Finney. That uh, why not let him work on playing some center? Uh, yeah. Uh, during the during the preseason, you know, because I I don't you know I think we know who he is and and what his upside and and all is at guard. If there's any position I would like to have seen him play and get better at potentially during the preseason, it would have been center. Uh, how do you no feel center about snaps for Finney? Okay, it was 85 at right guard and 23 at left guard according to our Tom Mead. All right, how do you feel about J.C. Hassenhauer as your backup center right now? I think I like him a bit more than you do, but I think the team likes him more than either of us, where they okay. really, you know, are fine with him being the backup. So I think if they're going to look for anything to add here, it's going to be, I mean, maybe someone who can play center because if you play interior backup, you probably you know, do both and often in, 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 in most cases. But um, I think they're looking more for a guard than a center, and that's why Finney and Coward got their, the axe, although, again, you know, Finney could, could circle back, and Coward, I guess, could circle back as well. Yeah, I, I, I'm, 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 that's what I'm hoping for. I'm hoping for a vet center's brought in here that could you know, potentially play guard. Yeah, I think it's going to be more guard that could potentially play third string center, but okay. we'll see. So 24 kept on offense, flipping over to defense, and right off the bat, defense aligned. You know, the question was, we knew this was going to be the area where the most difficult decisions would come for the Steelers in terms of potential cuts and who you're going to keep and who you're going to cut. The Steelers said, well, let's just keep them all. We're not going to make any tough decisions here. So we're keeping eight, which is seven is – six is the norm. Seven is heavy. Eight is <laughs> unheard of. Um, and so the eight they're keeping are, which is just everybody. It's Cam Hayward, Stephon Tewitt, Chris Wormley, Isaiah Loudermilk, Henry Mondo, Tyson Aluwalu, Isaiah Bugs. And Carlos Davis. Now, they're not going to have eight going to Buffalo. There's no way they're going to keep eight of these guys here. So the question is, who gets the axe? And and for what reason? Could Stefan Tu go to IR? That's possible. Jerry Dulac had a semi-report last night that said that said the Steelers were quote considering placing Tu on IR. Also called it a knee injury. So now we're getting maybe some inkling of what the actual injury is. Although we don't know any more details than that. Um, could someone get cut here if they bring in a you know, DB, you bring in an offensive lineman, a Mondo, or someone like that. Could that, could that, you know, give someone the axe? That's certainly possible as well. But for now, it's eight, and that's where we sit today. Not a bad eight either, is it? Strongest position on this team, top to bottom here. D line was was awesome in camp in the preseason. I mean, do you remember? A, I don't remember the last time this. Uh, we went back and and the the year that they had, they claimed Kashad Lyons off uh, off of waivers. I think it was the last time they even had seven. Uh, I, I can't even remember. I, I don't think there's been a time, uh, I'll, I'll have to go way back to see the last time. Maybe they had eight on their 53, at least come, come the week one of the season there. Uh, yeah, something's going to happen here. Uh, you would think though, if you needed a spot, I mean, Henry Mondo, he's not, he wouldn't, he wouldn't get claimed or anything like that. So there, I, I think there's a reason he's stuck and that's the fact that he's going to stick. And so, I, I mean, I, I think the obvious here is, and it's been part of this whole, is it going to be six or seven, it ended up being eight, uh, equation here is, what's, what, what's, what's the word on to it, you know? Mm-hmm. And I think the most obvious looking move here at this point would be, all right, go ahead and send, and especially being the, the IR can be three weeks, you know, minimum. Uh, to go ahead and send to it to IR there, that would make the most sense. You get the uh, position back open to bring back, uh, I don't know, Finney or something like that there. Right. And then you go into week one with, uh, because also on, on, on top of it, you know, uh, even even with seven, you know, you're probably not going to, not ready to dress louder milk just yet. So mm-hmm. so that's one. So that, that puts you down to six. And uh, do you need, you know, do you need to dress six? total we'll see but uh i i I think this eight's gonna become at least seven here within the next i don't know 48 hours or so with i'm with with, you with with to it going to ir yeah i'm with you on that i think too it seems to be where things are trending um they normally only dress five on game day but they could go with six just to give themselves extra depth knowing kind of all the you know guys that have to try to replace two with snaps it won't be just one guy and so you want to be spread that out among a couple younger guys in this first game of the year while you're not you know, trying to put too much on, on, on one guy's plate, especially a young one. So yeah, let's assume two, it goes to IR that puts you at seven and then even then potentially maybe someone could get knocked off the roster. If you bring in a DB or something like that, I think that's less likely, but uh, we'll see. But bottom line is they will not have eight. 
um, going into week one. We'll have to see, see the way this thing um, matriculates out uh, to the 53 for, for, for week one. But, I mean, you got, you've got got potential a, 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 a two dogs, one worm. Uh, two dogs, one warmly uh, <laughs> situation. How long have you been sitting on that one for? <laughs> a little Most while. Summer. I've been waiting yeah. for that one. Uh, two dogs, one warmly to and, and I went warmly to one that had to bust up the uh, the yeah, the, the, fight. the fracas last year between those two. There, I'm starting mm-hmm. to try to use bigger words here. Yeah, uh, you got matriculate. You got this I Hank Stram thing going. Yeah, on. yeah, fracas and uh, matriculate. Yeah. Uh, but uh, uh, you see where I'm going there. I think you got uh, potential, maybe uh, two dogs, one wormly there in, 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 in Bugs and Davis for a game day uh, helmet should you choose to only dress five. And then that would obviously, and, and assuming you, you enter week one with uh, with seven, then obviously I think you have louder milk that would be inactive. And then one of the two of uh, either, e- e- either Davis or Bugs, because I think Henry Mondo, you know, probably going to be running down and doing some stuff on kickoff team, probably. Yeah, if he's active, he certainly can do that. And Davis has shown the ability to, to do that and get work there this summer. Uh, but, yeah, I'm just happy to see all those guys make it. I mean, I think they're all deserving of it. Bugs and, and Davis, to me, have had really strong summers. And so, again, we'll kind of see what roles are and who sticks and, and all that. But D-line is, to me, the strongest position on this team top to bottom. And so I think you know that was the – the decision here, which is to keep your talent for now. Even if we had seen this coming with, uh, you know, or, 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 or I had, I still stuck with six. I think you had the seven, yeah, uh, seven. Uh, uh, there on, on your prediction there. Uh, you know, it would have all revolved around to it and it still even would have been hard. I think at that point to predict, are they going to really keep eight? You know, so, mm-hmm. I mean, you could you you could come up with scenarios for seven, obviously, but uh, the eight number was a bit surprising to me. Yeah, um, I don't know anyone who had eight defense alignment on their 53. But again, um, that won't be the case. Probably 40. Next time we talk on the podcast, probably won't be having eight uh, defense alignment on the 53. All right. All right, outside linebacker keeping four, and they are T.J. Watt, Alex Highsmith, Melvin Ingram, and Jameer Jones. So that last uh, push that Jones had in the, in the finale, three and a half special teams tackles, is enough to edge out the vet Cassius Marsh and the draft pick Quincy Roche. So to me, he's a topic of my terrible take today, Dave. J- Jameer Jones, the true camp darling of the summer, and I think he'll stick this time, unlike a Tuzar skipper who, who got the, uh, the axe 24 hours later. But uh, Jameer Jones, well-deserved, and uh, I think he stays. I think I, I'm proud the way we kind of worked through that as well too, and 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 gave it time to materialize during the preseason. And uh, if there was that one guy that 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 you turn around and you say at after that final preseason game, especially when it came to special teams, that that uh, if there was one guy that was going to knock Cassius Marsh out of that spot, it was Jameer Jones, and that indeed uh, that indeed happened. And this goes back to. Uh, what you say every year, I think, or what you remind people every come every starting, I don't know, what January, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, no such thing as as camp bodies here. You know, not many people batted an eye when Jameer Jones was signed uh, to the uh, to the offseason roster. When did that actually happen, by the way? It was after his pro day. I think it was early April. I want to say I was looking that up last night. Uh, April seventh, it was officially announced by the okay. team. Okay, and 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 probably not too many people batted an eye at at, at that, you know, when when it happened there. But uh, uh, you know, as this thing went on, it just goes to show you that you know you don't know where some of these guys are going to come from at, at some time, and that's why you know once a guy is signed, we try to do you know, kind of a, a, a film room on the kid and, 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 and start learning as much about him as possible. And, you know, good, good for him because he showed, I thought he really showed right out of the shoot there. Uh, obviously you got to see him at training camp. Uh, uh, but, uh, the fact that he was given the opportunity to play on his feet right away, uh, on both sides of the line. And I, I really think if you go back to what Keith Butler said several weeks ago, uh, that was a very, very key quote when it came down to Jameer Jones and Quincy Roche and how much they really thought of, uh, uh, uh Jameer Jones and then also his uh, uh, special team potential, which that came out as the preseason went on as well for him. So uh, good deal there. I mean, uh, a lot to like, I think, even as a pass rusher, God forbid you should need it. But mm-hmm. a guy, too, that I think, you know, at some point he's probably going to get six, you know, five, six snaps a game, at, you know, as games materialize there. And so far, I like what I've seen so uh, out of him. And, yeah. and that's not even counting the special team stuff. 
Sure. The conclusion of my take today is don't call him a camp body. Mm. Call him a Pittsburgh Steeler because that's what he is right now. And so kudos to him. This guy's had a heck of a journey, undrafted free agent. Uh, you know, his dad almost lost his dad to COVID last year when oh, he's with Houston, doesn't make the team. And then, you know, he gets signed off the pro day circuit. And so credit to the Steelers. They were as aggressive as any team in signing guys from the pro days. Um, you know, obviously they're there to watch guys work, but also signing guys like Jimmy Jones and Tyler Simmons um, and others. But Jones uh, makes a team. So heck of a path and heck of a way to make it. But uh, that's what camp in the preseason is all about and that's why i'm so glad there was a preseason in terms of games this year because if you don't have those games it's really hard to show you're a good special teams player and jameer jones had that led the team in tackles with six and makes the 53 all right uh all right uh and everybody's happy that uh, cassius marsh is not part of it <laughs> yeah well i i think he'll sign to the practice squad i mean Maybe I'm not going to guarantee it, but I think the team would like him to at least some that depth there. I mean, we 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 think for sure Roche is going to make it. The, uh, mm-hmm. uh, the question is, is are are you going to keep another one in in Cassius Marsh? You know, so right, right. That, that'll be interesting to watch play out. We'll see. Inside linebacker gets interesting here. They keep six, so pretty heavy. I don't think anyone had six predicted. Um, they are Devin Bush, Joe Schobert, Robert Spillane, Buddy Johnson, Marcus Allen, and UG3, which was the biggest surprise of all to me. Now, that could be tied into Marcus Allen with that hamstring injury that he suffered in the finale against Carolina. Um, that could be mean a potential trip to IR for Marcus Allen, like two, which would keep him out the first three weeks of the season. Um, so that's a surprise there was, was them keeping six and them keeping UG three. Yeah, I didn't see that one coming for sure. Uh, and, and, and if I, if you would have told me I had to keep an extra player in there somewhere, it probably wouldn't have been uh UG three. Uh, but is this a sign maybe that something's up with Marcus Allen and that, that injury that he suffered the other night? And could he also be going to, uh, to, to IR here in the next, you know, whatever, 48 hours or whatnot? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's certainly possible. Um, I'll just put it this way. I think maybe UG3 got a bit better as the preseason went on, but his play overall did not warrant the roster spot. So, um, you know, that, that that one was definitely a surprise there. Um, again, we'll see what happens. You know, if Allen goes to IR, then that will make more sense. Um, and I guess there's a chance that UG3 could be cut if they bring in somebody else and Allen does not go to IR. But uh, stay tuned for that one. Just like D-line, I don't think they'll be carrying six inside linebackers to, to Buffalo. The only thing, uh, it goes back to UG3 and uh, especially the start of the last two seasons, right, with his ability on uh, on special teams. Uh you know, he's a better mm-hmm. tackler on special teams than he is <laughs> after someone catches the football out in space, it seems like there. Uh, who, if if market based on the current construction of this 53 right now, all right, and let's assume that Marcus Allen has to go to, go to IR, who is, who is your up back? That's a good question. Uh, the way it worked in camp in the preseason was the starter was Marcus Allen, the backup was Trey Norwood, and third stringer was Donovan Steiner. Oh. Steiner didn't make the team. Norwood made the team, and will he be active? I'm starting to think he will be, but we'll see what the rest of the roster moves look like. So um, right now, if it's not Allen, I think it'd be Trey Norwood, but they have done even in the past where some guy who didn't do it at all in the preseason ended up doing it for week one. So um, tentatively, I'll go Norwood. Has Benny Snell ever done that in camp setting or? or no, he's no? a wing. Okay. Not that I'm aware of. He's always been a left or right wing. And Belage ha- ha- has it, hasn't either? No, he's. I don't know if he did it in Miami or other places. I'd have to check that. He didn't do it in Pittsburgh. Um, Caleb Brew, I'm sure, could do it as well. He's gotten work as a wing as well, but he's a smart guy. He could probably be right back if, if need be on, on the I, fly. I just wonder if Danny would let a rookie in Norwood do it, you know? Yeah. I, that's a good question. I I would be nervous about that. I so would too. I think I'd even just tell Killebrew to do it and, and teach him the next two weeks. I think he'd do that without an issue. UG3 hasn't done it, right? No. He's barely been healthy enough to play out there, <laughs> but uh, he's not. He's usually like the left guard or you know on the line in terms of the punt coverage team. All right, do you think this is a sign Marcus Allen's going to IR? Yes. I do too. Because those hamstrings can be tricky, and it just might not be ready. But uh, we'll see. We'll see what happens. I mean, that, that's, right, the, that's the only real good reason. I, I, uh, and and UG 3s ability to play on special teams to be a core member and someone maybe Danny Smith kind of trust uh, there. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if Danny Smith had the big say in that, and them coming to him and say, "Look, you're not going to have Marcus Allen 
uh, 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 first couple weeks of the season, who do you want? You know, right. uh, so that, that's if, the only way I could see it. If Allen goes to IR, do you think UG3 gets the, the helmet over Buddy Johnson for week one? Uh, I think you could dress both of them, couldn't you? Yeah, you could. I mean, depending on how you construct it. But it, OK, so you think both could dress? I, I think there's a good uh, good chance of that. Yeah. OK, yeah, fair enough. All right, at corner, some um, some surprises here, just keeping force. Really light in places like the O-line and the secondary. So the four corners right now are Joe Hayden, Cam Sutton, James Pierre, and Justin Lane. That means Arthur Millette was cut, which it, I think qualifies as, as a minor surprise just for depth purposes. He was not great this preseason. He was, he was average to below and dealt with an ankle injury. But, um, again, this would signal that they're adding somebody because at the leash you need depth here, especially that backup slot position, position where it's just Cam Sutton and I suppose Trey Norwood. I got a little something coming in here. I can't reveal the source here, though. But uh, uh, one of the two offensive linemen is going to round about a round. Okay. Not able to say which or. You know, uh, it certainly is. sounds like Rashad Coward, if you can believe okay. that. Yeah. Um, that is interesting. Okay. That, that's good. Good information there. Um, it's not surprising to see someone circle back. Um, again, they weren't going to roll with just eight offensive linemen and just one backup into your offensive linemen at a host an hour. So you knew they were going to add in some form or fashion. It just, you know, we thought maybe more Finney than, than, than coward, but, uh, I have said that they, they, they seem to like coward a good bit, although I think he is very de- developmental and raw and, um, still would he dress on game day? I guess he probably would. He'd probably have one of the tackles down and have host an hour and, and, and presumably coward up. Uh, this this is a pretty good source too. <laughs> okay. Okay. I believe. So uh, uh, we'll, uh, we'll 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 see. A- at a minimum, Coward's going to the practice squad, but uh, this source uh, uh, expects a roundabout to happen here. All right. Good deal there. So yeah, look at look at that. Some Steelers Depot breaking news right here on the podcast. Right. Hey. Uh, you love to see. Hey. It. Love, but, love, to uh, see it. Love, love some of these people reaching out to me and, and all of this stems from uh, an article Matthew Mar- Marksy wrote this morning too. the the great Matthew Marksy, mm-hmm. uh, uh, the buy or sell article that he did this morning on will the Steelers bring back Finney or Coward to the offensive line room. So yeah. uh, you never know what kind of stuff is going to uh, bring you sources out of the blue. So there mm-hmm. you go. There you go. So uh, back here to cornerback again, Hayden, Sutton, Pierre, Lane. Will Millette be someone who circles back? Um, again, they're going to add somebody here in some form or fashion. Man, I didn't see uh, – I mean, I understand it because we talked about <laughs> the slot uh, and, and and wondering, man, you know, it, it, Millette the last man standing just by default, you know? Uh, mm-hmm. The play wasn't great overall. There, uh, even if they bring Millette back as as part of this roundabout, which is possible, uh, they need to do something else. And I think we've said that throughout this thing here. Uh, they need to add either another player that can play slot uh, or a free safety type or both. Uh, uh, w- would not hurt my feelings there. So something's going to happen there because there is no way that this team goes into, in my opinion, in week one with eight defensive backs on the 53. Right. The good news to me is there are more options in terms of adding some secondary help than there would be uh, from the offensive line standpoint, waiver wire cut down perspective. And so if it's not Millette, I think there are some other options for this team to bring in. But yeah, they're going to bring in somebody at least. Uh, I would agree, and we'll talk about some possible outside choices here in a little bit, mm-hmm. I think. And kudos to Justin Lane to making the team. I mean, his spot was very much uncertain that first weekend. I thought this guy has really you know, diminishing odds of making the team, and he turned things around, and uh, granted, depth here was not great, and some of the undrafted guys did not maybe play the way we, we thought and hoped they would, but Lane played well and got better and made the team. Uh, yes, I, I think it started uh, not too long. Well, that first interception, and then, or was it the practices first that he kind of stood out? Oh, no, I think it was uh, the uh, the game against the Eagles first, and then I, I think you were reported that he started to show up a little bit more in practice, uh, training camp practices, and all like that. Now, uh, does it give you great comfort that uh, you know, uh, you know, if you get that far down in the depth chart, I guess? Uh, probably not, but I, I thought he did enough with what they have or what they had on the roster 
to get that spot. And then once again, I, one of the things that continually stuck out to me, at least, and it might be one of the main things that, that, that's, that's, that, that's going to keep him around, is uh, he's a pretty pretty good gunner. He's able to get mm-hmm. all get down the field and and get off some of those vices and 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 get on down there. So uh, uh, I wasn't shocked that he made it. No, uh, I was just more shocked that there's only eight defensive backs right mm-hmm. now. Right, and so four corners means four safeties, and those four safeties are Minka Fitzpatrick, Terrell Edmonds, Miles Killebrew, and Trey Norwood. I'm not surprised they only kept four safeties because I didn't know who the number five safety would be on this team. Um, so those are your four, and we'll see if they add somebody. But um, those four themselves, Fitzpatrick, Edmonds, Norwood, and Killebrew, to me, really no surprises there. Yeah, if anybody missed this one, shame on you because it was almost mm-hmm. it was almost a default four, I think. There, uh, uh, as this thing went on, especially when they uh, as, as they talked up Norwood more as the uh, uh, as, as the preseason went on there, and then also with uh, Antoine Brooks Jr. Once he got removed from the picture, there. Uh, it made it pretty clear. Look, I mean, you knew you knew who your top three were going to be, and you knew Killer Brew was going to be one of those. Uh, the only question, I think, for the last at least the last two or th- two weeks or so, it became clear that Norwood was going to be a lock mm-hmm. on on this roster, and that was that was really the only thing there. Speaking of Antoine Brooks Jr., uh, and I think we were the only ones to have this yesterday, uh, as expected, as we predicted, uh, Antoine Brooks Jr. was waived from IR with an injury settlement. So. Uh, I think the only question was, and I think we brought this up on the podcast a uh, couple, uh, uh, you know, when he was originally went to IR or when he cleared waivers and reverted to IR, is what did the what did the NFL do do with the rule about either six weeks, you know, plus the uh, injury settlement time, or is it less because of the the uh, the the league having uh, three week minimum now? And I think through. Uh, doing some research both on my end and I think the great Matthew Marks he did as well too. Uh, we have uh, come to the conclusion that it's three weeks plus whatever the injury settlement time is. So mm-hmm. we do not know the injury settlement time yet. That should come up here as soon as the amount. We should be able to uh, uh, do the backwards math on that as soon as it hits the uh, salary cap there. But uh d- I, and I think you probably agree with this. Don't be surprised we see Antoine Brooks Jr. back with this team, I don't know, five, six, seven weeks from now. Sure. Now, that could be probably – it would probably start practice squad first. Mm-hmm. He probably wouldn't go straight to the 53, correct? Mm-hmm. Okay, so he goes practice squad first the way that Anthony Johnson did last season. So, yeah, I think there's a good chance of that. Yeah, probably end of the month, early uh, into October. Um, you'll see Brooks circle back once he gets right, and the, a lot of time has, has passed. Uh, I would think at a minimum, probably a two-week uh, probably settlement with him. We'll see. We yeah. obviously don't know the full nature of the injury, but it's happened. That happened uh, uh, Hall of Fame game, and that seems like it's been two months ago now. Uh, uh, there, so I I would think maybe two, five. You know, uh, I think a good chance that you know week week six or so we could potentially see him back. And like you said, uh, on the practice squad initially, unless they have an immediate need, you know. Right. Uh, with an injury or whatnot there. But uh, do not be shocked if you see him back with this team mid- midway through the season. Mm-hmm. So stay tuned for that. And to wrap things up here on the initial 53, the specialists. And again, there was a lot of attention paid to not kicker, which of course is Chris Boswell, but punter and long snapper. So uh, the new kids have taken over, mm-hmm. David. It is uh, Presley Harvin III, the punter, and Christian Kuntz, the long snapper. So Jordan Berry and Cameron Kennedy, the veterans, unfortunately lose their jobs. Yeah, once again, I you know head, heading into training camp at least uh, I don't think either one of us would have said, you know what, we're going to have a long snapping battle <laughs> that we're going to look forward to here. But uh, uh, I think, uh, and once again, you know, the writing was on the wall there. Once you went from what was it, eighty-five to eighty, or was it? Right now, the second cuts was eighty-five to eighty. Right, uh, uh, when they went eighty-five to eighty, was all right. Well. Uh, what what's happening here, you know, and uh, that 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 obviously went into the finale, and uh, it wasn't hard to make a educated guess that maybe Koontz was going to overtake uh, Canada there. You had obviously been tracking the punter uh, competition all along there. Uh, did they make the right choice? 
Yeah, I think they did. Um, I think both guys punted talking about that position. They, they did extremely well. I thought Barry had a really strong camp, but um, I think Harvin has more upside in the sense of not just because he's a rookie, but because some of those hang times can be really elite. And so finding that consistency will still be important for him. But I mean, he can produce hang times and punts that Jordan Barry just simply isn't capable of. And so in that regard, you're talking, you know, five point, you know, one second plus hang times, which are elite numbers. Now we'll have to see if that translates to in game type stuff. And, you know, in December, it'll be tougher to do. But, um, I think the the upside and the the highs of, of pH three are higher than the highs of Jordan Berry. Uh, I would agree, and people would be rioting right now if they had cut pH three, yeah. uh, 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 you know, in lieu of Berry. Right, and then with Koontz and Canada, I mean, I can't tell you too well if that's the right decision or not. I think Koontz did a good job in the finale, one and a half tackles, and his snap seemed to be accurate. And I think Canada definitely did struggle last season, so. Uh, you know, will that be the right decision? I guess time will tell. But but new snapper, new holder for Boz. And so we'll see if there's any sort of impact or effect on him. Hopefully not. But, um, you know, that operation had been pretty much the same with, with Barry and Canada and Boz for several years now, say for the first month of last season. And so um, there'll be some, some newness there for Boz. Uh, absolutely. And that'll be one thing that we monitor as this thing goes on. Uh, hopefully, hopefully it makes zero zero difference at all yeah. as far as the the uh the mechanisms and all go let's hope so so though that is your initial 53 and again that is the emphasis on the word initial because so much can and will change this roster very very unlikely to be set in stone um for week one when this team travels to buffalo and so we'll see this team probably make some moves potentially for shot coward coming back to the 53 as dave just mentioned potentially some outsiders also being signed to this team, which is pretty common this time of year. And so uh, this morning, Dave, I put up a post on Steelers Depot with um, it's kind of a wish list, but also just kind of a here are some options kind of deal, because obviously the guys who got cut aren't always the most talented. and They certainly come with their own problems. So offensive linemen, um, you knew they were going to look for probably an interior guy. Certainly if someone circles back, then that may, might just end up being the guy. But some names here that I thought made sense were Carson Green from Houston, Matt Skur from Miami, it's been uh, suggested a lot by by you and a lot of other Steelers fans. Um, Dakota Dozier from Minnesota, even Derwin Gray, who from Tennessee got cut uh, the other day. And so I have the list there of kind of interior versatile offensive linemen who could make sense for this team. Uh, I like them. Uh, I I won't be surprised if it's one of them. Uh, I'm rooting for. I, I'm I I'm I uh, I am in the Scura fan club uh, right now. No, no. All seriousness, I think that this team needs to. Get a get a more center type in now now especially now assuming our source that 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 gave us this information uh, is correct here. Uh, what is that? Are you more apt to get a center now, knowing that Coward's really a guard? Um, or or I'd, I'd just or, be looking for talent. I mean, okay. just trying to because it's hard to find the talent there, and usually those guys can play both, not always, and, and obviously Coward can't. Um, or will they? Will, will they even add at all? I yeah. guess now is the question. You know, right? There's really they probably. I don't think they if they bring back one of or Coward. I don't think they bring in anybody else because that that's number ten. They're not going to dress, and I mean, you have I think enough enough guys there. Uh, plus your practice squad guys that you're gonna gonna sign. Uh, who on your list of offensive linemen do you favor the most? Do I personally like the most? Right. Uh, um, that's a good question. It wasn't really about like a great number of talent here. I just think some versatility. Um, yeah, from an actual talent standpoint, I don't know. Jermaine, I, I don't know how to say his last name here. Illuminor, I think it is. Jermaine Illuminor, um, former Raven, big body guy, kind of liked his game some. That's probably the top talent uh, that, I, that I listed there. You know, when you when when you think about it, if, if indeed it is Rashard Coward, if, if no one else has to go to IR or anything, you know, any other surprises? Now, it is it is worth mentioning what the heck's going on with Zach Banner. You know, yeah, uh, uh, who knows at this point? I mean, he's not practicing uh, right now, and. Uh, was left back in Pittsburgh, right, for treatment. Uh, and since then, we have uh, Dan Moore playing left tackle and Chiquamo Corfort right tackle. You know, could there be something like a banner to IR situation? I suppose, uh, uh, you know, you, you don't want to you don't want to think about that. But, I, you know, uh, until it doesn't happen at this point, I, I think it's plausible. Uh, so assuming he doesn't have to go to IR there and assuming Coward is the guy that comes back, maybe they don't add it all from the outside, you know? 
and yeah. and maybe Finney goes to uh, the practice squad, and and that's how you roll. I think that's entirely possible, and maybe even the preferred way, because trying to find offensive linemen on the waiver wire is tough to do. It's a lot of journeymen and and castoffs and 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 things like that. So let me give you a quick hot take here, Dave. Um, if Zach Banner can't play Week One, um, and I, what I would personally want to have happen is I want Joe Hague at right tackle in that game. Our left tackle could be a core four or, or Dan Moore Jr. But if you want to actually have a decent run blocking team, Chakuma core four cannot be your starting right tackle. And so I'd rather put Hague there because he's he's a good run blocker. Pass pro is an issue, but um, I, I'll live with that. I'll mitigate it. But um, if you want to get a push up front, um, but core four is not going to be the guy. Boy, I never thought when Joe Haig was signed that we'd be talking about <laughs> <laughs> you never know how these things are going to go, right? right. Uh, some of the things that you'd swear that you'd never talk about, uh, you end up talking about. I get it, Alex. I, I, I understand the reasoning there, especially from the run blocking, because if there was one area that Joe Haig did excel at, and really when we talked about originally when Joe Haig was signed, we were thinking, okay, this is the guy that could be the perfect extra guy, you know, extra end of the mm-hmm. line of scrimmage, uh, extra uh, eligible guy. And why? Because he can run block. And, and I think PFF, whatever is was graded him, I was like one of the best run blockers in, in, in the whole preseason of anyone. I think yeah, so. I've gone back and forth with them on the side with one of their graders uh, who I'm uh, become friends with and direct messaging there wondering who's who's breaking down that tape. So I think it's been good. I don't think it's been as good as what they think it's been good mm. uh, with them, but it has been good. And once again, it goes back to what we originally said when Haig was signed. He's a good run blocker and somebody that you wouldn't mind as a, as a tackle eligible, right? Uh, right. So I get it. Uh, I don't know. We might we might be outnumbered with the guys that actually make the decision here, though. You know, seems like it. Yeah, I'm obviously with with the core for working at right tackle, and I and, and I and I'm not saying this will happen, but I'm just saying if you want to run the ball, a core four is not going to be your answer to to do that. We also uh, we also think that uh, this team's nickel should include Pierre on the outside and Sutton on uh, in, in the slot. Whether you know we'll we'll put our wants in one hand and see see how it shakes out in the other. <laughs> we might not get our wish. I, I I do get where you're coming from there though. So yeah. uh, uh, would I be okay with that? Yeah, it would be quite the indictment on a core four, though, you know, uh, which it, it deservingly so at this point from what we've seen so far. I mean, you got a guy that's uh, really one of your highest earning uh, outside of uh, – out, I'm trying to think how, what, what the hierarchy goes. I guess Trey Turner makes a little bit more than than, than a core four does, but, but I think a core four hit the uh, – one of the proven, proven performance escalator or whatnot. So he's making a couple million dollars now uh, as well there. Quite an indictment on him if he can't man one of your – well, I think Zach Banner's up there too, come to think of yeah, it. But he's Banner's not – probably. But, uh, it's, it's a very cheap offense line overall though. Yeah. So it's not saying a whole lot. you got two two guys on rookie contracts there. Well, Corfor's on his rookie deal, I guess, as well. So, I mean, it's you know it's not the uh, the highest paid offense. It's probably the, the least amount of money invested in offensive line in the NFL. I mean, but but it just goes back to man. This is a guy that you thought that uh, in a core for okay. Well, at least he's going to the left side, his better side, you know, and he mm-hmm. he, he he can't even nail that down, you know. Uh, so I get where you're coming from. It'll be interesting to see which way this goes. Uh, but, but oh boy, if Okorafor starts the uh, 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 week one as your as your swing guy, whew. yeah, that that says a whole lot there. But uh, I think he'll start. I think. They would just start him at right tackle, but I just don't think that's the best thing for the team. I think he's left tackle or bust. I think also. What, what, do, you, what the, do you think about Moore going back over to the left side in practice? You know, I just it's a more comfortable spot. I mean, if Banner is not available, Dan Moore needs to play left tackle in this game and against the Bills because he's not comfortable enough at, at right tackle yet, especially against a Bills scheme that's going to throw a lot at him and it's going to really mess with him and it's really stressed his offense line the last two seasons. So I get that. I, I, I think that makes more sense than playing Dan Moore at right tackle a spot he's not comfortable with. Okay. Uh, Going to be interesting to see how this lines up week one. I think it's more likely this team adds someone in the secondary, some sort of slot corner or safety up more so than it is offensive line, um, especially if, if Coward or Finney comes back to the 53. And so some more talent here, I think more interesting names. Carl Joseph will probably be the most popular name that's been talked about the last 24 hours since uh, the Raiders released him. Uh, Pittsburgh brought him in back in, I think, March it was um, for a visit. He left without a deal, signed 
um, back with Las Vegas, but uh, now that he's on the market again, Pittsburgh has not um, brought in anyone new for a safety spot. I think Joseph to Pittsburgh, again, makes a lot of sense. He is the most Mike Hilton guy without being Mike Hilton, right? Can he play in the slot like that, though? I mean, is he? I mean, obviously he can play some, but is he really going to be a full-time slot guy? Yeah, good question. Uh, but the, even a better question, I think, when it comes to him, there is was it was one hundred thirty-seven thousand five hundred dollars enough reason for him not to sign with the Steelers? Apparently, I don't know whatever the reason was, but. For some reason, he didn't. You know, I, you know, and it's a question worth asking. If he came mm-hmm. in and he didn't sign, was it them not wanting to sign him? Was it him not wanting to sign with the Steelers? And then just a couple of weeks, you know, or not even, a, what was it, about, was it two weeks later, a week and a half, two weeks later, he signs with the Raiders for a minimum a veteran salary benefit deal with a with uh, with the only guaranteed money being the signing bonus of one hundred thirty seven thousand five hundred, which is the minimum or which is the maximum that you can give a player for it to qualify to be a veteran signing benefit. So, uh, did they see something there, the medical or or, or 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 something like that? That that's a huge question mark in my mind. I can understand if a guy bypasses the Steelers uh, and then you know, uh, goes and signs for a couple million more, but we're only talking, or or maybe he just got told that he wasn't going to get an opportunity to, st- or couldn't be given the, uh, 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 a clarification to get an opportunity to start. I don't know, but right. it, it is quite confusing at this point now, looking back at it and knowing what he signed for with the Raiders. And this is a guy that, that you, you think has a pretty good relationship with, 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 with Mike Tomlin as well, too, going all the way back to the pro day, right? I mean, Mike, sure. Mike Thomas spent a lot of time with Carl Joseph at that uh, West Virginia Pro Day several years ago. And uh, and at the time, obviously, the Steelers needed, I think, a safety and and, and all like that. So uh, now, Carl Joseph, uh, are you a bit concerned? Because he has had some injury issues here. Uh, and he missed the first two preseason games of the Raiders with unspecified injury he did play in the third one and he played a lot too and he played pretty well i i thought overall look kind of kind of jumped uh, at, at the tape real quick there uh he is the most obvious guy on the list though right and the question is, is is can he play slot yeah and just i guess the overall concern and granted this is a concern with any player but you know why has he been cut so much and taking these small small level deals and not able to really stick on on anyone's team and so that's always a question for i guess any of these guys but um I, yeah i think he's yeah would i would i envision him as the, the slot guy probably not but just as general kind of versatile safety depth i think that's kind of w- would be his role in pittsburgh maybe I mean, maybe dime even uh uh you know he does have some free he's not the ideal free safety either you know, but he's played all over. I mean, he's, he's but, played all those spots. Right. But we talked about throughout this thing, we need a guy that can be versatile and can play on special teams and, and more than anything, you know, and, and look, you know, maybe, maybe you can get some slot ability out of him as well. There, a guy that you're not afraid to put in the box to help out against the run, uh, in, in cert- certain situations there. So the most obvious name on the list, there is one other, uh, you know, a uh, uh, guy that Washington parted ways with. It'll be interesting to watch what happens with him. Yeah, the three true slot guys on my list are Jimmy Moreland from Washington, who, bit of a weird situation, got waived injured with apparently a knee injury, although it's considered to be minor, and he'll be ready for week one. So Pittsburgh could claim him and, and get him ready for week one. The question would be, when's he ready to practice, and does he have enough reps to play and, and, and all that stuff? But um, that was a surprise cut for sure. Nate Harrison from Denver, and then a personal favorite of mine is Corn Elder from Detroit. Been a starter for the Panthers in past seasons, uh, a Hilton light kind of guy that I think would be uh, a cheap ad, obviously, and just 26 years old. Also an Ole Miss product, too, right? Corn Elder? No, he went to the U. The U, okay. Uh, he is a guy that we have talked about before, right? In, I think in so. Certain, in certain circles uh, when he was a free agent before, I think. Who, yeah. who am I thinking about Is was the other Ole Miss product that was the, uh, in addition to Hilton? Not, that, not Sanquist Golson, is it? No, I thought there was another one. I, I know, I know. We have mentioned mentioned uh, Elder's name on this podcast before, and probably even written about him. I'm probably getting him confused with, with, uh, with somebody else there. But uh, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I like all those, all the, all those that that, that we've kind of worked through, and and 
Uh, I don't think uh, Washington parted ways with, uh, or Denver parted ways with the one that, uh, who, who was the one over there that everybody thought they were going to part ways with or possibly trade? Oh, Bryce Callahan. Yeah, Callahan there. Yeah, it, it, yeah I think you further you got into this, uh, you kind of wondered if, if, if indeed he was going to be on the outs with them. Uh, overall, so I think the interesting thing there with, uh, with 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 Jimmy is how bad is that knee injury, and yeah. if it was a bad enough to waive him, like because you know if you read and and you know it, it all depends on who writes what and you know the quality of, of 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 their scouting abilities and all like that. He seemed to have had a good preseason, and in fact, even up until I went and watched back and rewatched some of the Ravens uh, Washington game uh, there. I never saw the, where he got injured at. Now, obviously I haven't looked at the all 22 on that. I just watched the TV tape on that. And I even think he was involved in that play that, uh, uh, that JK Dobbins got injured on. Mm. Uh, but uh, he played 40 something snaps uh, in that game on defense and another, I don't know, nine, 10 on special teams. I never saw where he got injured and I thought he played pretty good overall. And there, there's some people, uh, that, 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 that you trust that, that, that follow Washington closely that, that are a bit surprised that he was on the outs. And mm-hmm. uh, if you go back and look at some of these slot, uh, performance, uh, of, uh, next gen stats from last year alone, uh, makes you wonder, man, what, why the heck are they, are they waving this guy? So I guess what I'm getting at there is maybe the knee injury is a little bit more serious than what the beat writers letting on about. Maybe it's more than just a, a, a bone bruise because I don't think you I don't think you subject a guy like that to waivers. Uh, you know, unless you're pretty sure you can get him back to IR. I don't know. It'd be interesting to yeah. watch it play out though. It was a weird situation. Yeah, there was there was some talent there that we kept our eye on. And you mentioned Troy Apke, who was kept. I look at Daryl Roberts, who it sounded like he was going to be on the outs, but was kept um, over Moreland, who, again, has this injury situation. So, yeah, a, a weird one to try to navigate. But um, if he's healthy or he's going to be healthy soon, then it's you know that, a talented player. That was a Marshall pro- – Roberts was a Marshall product, uh-huh. wasn't he? Yeah, Marshall. Yeah, okay. And then also should mention um, – uh, how do you say his name? Cravon LeBlanc, a former Eagle. I had this had on my others considered list, but that's a name that I do want to mention as well as a potential slot guy. Who are the two most likely on your list? Joseph has to be one of them, right? Yeah, I, I would say they're both uh, defensive backs. I'd probably say uh, Carl Joseph and I'll, I'll, I'll shoot my shot here and say Quinn Elder. But in terms of like what makes the most sense, obviously, because Joseph was brought in for the visit. I mean, how do you not say him? I thought for sure we have written or tweeted about Elder before. And we did a we have a, a scouting report and all that on him when he came out of Miami from you know 2017 or whenever it was. But um, I mean, I'm, I, I'm sure I mentioned his name occasionally, but maybe this past off season because he was switching teams, he you know, Carolina didn't bring him back with the uh, new new regime in. But um, I don't know if we've talked about him you know too much in depth. Okay, I do have that. We do have a profile, as you stated, on from 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 2017. There, maybe that's a guy to watch there. Did you watch yeah, any of him in the preseason or no? No, I did. I think people had said, though, that he had played well. I was just kind of searching some stuff on Twitter to see what the reaction to that was, and people thought that he had impressed in, in Detroit. And so that was, um, I think, I, I, I literally wrote here in my uh, scouting report back in 2017, I think Elder is next William Gay. So that's a little strong maybe Ooh. for me way back when. But, uh, uh, yeah, I, I've, I've always been high on his game. And, you know, the Steelers in the past have not been shy about guys that they played against in the preseason, right? And they yeah, just played. I mean, they just played the Lions. Uh, that's true. Yeah, how did Elder? I don't know how Elder did in that game. Uh, uh, look, I'm, I'm look. I'm. Uh, you got me curious now. Uh, he played quite a bit. Uh, let's see. Hold on a minute. That was last season. Here, let's look at preseason now. Uh, he only played in one preseason game on mm. defense. Okay. So he might have been dealing with an. He might have been dealing with an injury as well too. He played. Uh, he only played 16 snaps during the preseason, for mm. some reason there. Okay. Uh, and well, that was that was in the finale. Uh, in there, well, it's good that he's healthy now. I guess. I mean, that's yeah, good. and that's just like Joseph, right? Joseph played in the yeah. in, in, in the preseason finale as well too. Uh, he played on kick return, punt return, and field goal block as well too. Looks like six total. Uh, looks like six total special team snaps on top of 16 defensive snaps in one game. So I don't know, not, not a lot to go on there. Yeah. 
uh, we'll see. But uh, we'll get our answers here by probably by the time people are listening to this. To probably have some answers on practice squad and waiver wire ads and, and all that fun stuff. All right. Uh, uh, overall thoughts on, I mean, once again, we're, we're convinced that this 53 will have at least two new members on it come week one, maybe three, right? Yeah, an offensive lineman for sure, a, de- a defensive back for sure, and maybe something else that surprises us based on injury or, or otherwise. But All right, uh, we got some more breaking news coming in here. Uh, right. After yeah. This from Adam Schefter. After approaching the Steelers about an extension to finish his career in Pittsburgh, Pro mm-hmm. Bowl cornerback Joe Hayden has decided to play out his contract and test the free agent market uh, in 2022 when the cap is expected to increase significantly per his agent, Drew Rosenhaus. And that's, uh, that's not surprising at all. Uh, and I think when I wrote about them, we talked about this in, 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 uh, in the past there, uh, while there was some level of plausibility to potentially uh, him getting a deal, you would have to think that uh, he would have to have taken less than the new money average that he got the last time, or right, or at least equal to the new money average that he got the last time, which I believe was $11 million new money average uh, there. And even that sounded a little bit rich with all what the Steelers have going on, especially with Joe's age and and all that kind of stuff there. So I don't think there's going to be a lot of people shocked that Joe is not going to sign a contract extension here before the start of the uh, start of the regular season, right? Yeah, not surprised. I know Hayden wanted it, and I understand that, but uh, I just couldn't justify giving you know a 32 year old corner, or however old he is, um, an extension like that, even if the money you know wasn't going to be significantly in terms of significant in terms of the, the guaranteed portion of it and all that kind of stuff. But um, yeah, this was always to me the most logical and likely outcome. All right. All right, uh, Dave, let's get to some Ruder emails here and close out today's show, unless there's anything else that you would like to uh, to talk about. Uh, people are going to wonder why we have not talked about Juju yet, I guess. Uh, uh, let's, give, okay. let, let's give some thoughts on uh, Juju um, uh, milk crating it. I, mean, I think it was dumb, not just for him. I think it's just dumb in general. If anyone does the milk crate challenge, I think someone died that way, I read. So, I mean, you just kind of risk yourself getting hurt. So I'm not going to like sit here and bash the guy all day. I think there's a lot better things for us to do with our time and for us to discuss and more relevant things to talk about. But I don't think it was a good idea for him to do that. I'm not shaking my fist at the cloud here tweeting about it 73 times, but I mean, yeah, I think it was a dumb thing to do. Right. Uh, and you know, it did look like he have some, had some level of spotters there, mm-hmm. uh, uh, beside him. Uh, you know, whether or not that can, that's full, foolproof or not, you know, you know, who, who, you know, uh, you just hope you never have to find out there. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm I'm not going to kill the guy for it. Uh, you know, there's people saying, well, that's the reason why why most Steeler fans hate Juju. I think I mean I think Juju's still a great kid. I just think he gets caught up in kind of some of these, you know, things that he does off the field, you know, uh, and 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 the like. And uh, I was upset to see him. <laughs> you see some of these people do this thing and, and end up on their head. You know, yeah. right, someone someone died that way. They were doing it on concrete, which is an even worse idea. But yeah, it's 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 dangerous. You know, so uh, I was disappointed to see it. Uh, uh, but he did have, for whatever it's why I'm not excusing it, but it did look like he had two guys ready to catch him, or at least mm-hmm. attempt to catch him. Yeah, uh, attempt this thing. Uh, if he fell there, uh, I understand. <sighs> Once again, it's, it goes back to the whole optics thing, right? I mean, I think it goes back to just general safety. I mean, I don't care about the eye. Just don't want to get hurt. You know, just uh, you just don't want to see the guy doing that a couple of weeks out or, or never, but uh, especially a couple of weeks out from the start of the season there. So uh, I wonder if he got a uh, uh, a finger shake and a and a talking to uh, from from the organization there. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's it, it it didn't look good, and I understand why people why why people are upset about it. Yeah, I mean, again, I don't think it was a good idea, but again, I'm not going to sit here and, and dwell on it either because it's just there's just 70,000 more important things for us to talk about. All right, uh, but people will wonder why we why you know if we didn't address that why why we didn't. Now we have. Uh, I- anything else that we need to get to that 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 uh, transaction wise or anything that we've forgot? 
no, I think that's probably about everything. Certainly a lot more transactions to come, and we'll cover that on Friday's show. All right, uh, let's get to uh, some. Uh, and as far as salary cap goes, uh, uh, real quick, I have run through the initial uh, cut down of that. This team currently sits almost $16 million under the cap right now. And you think, man, that's a lot. Well, you still got T.J. Watt coming. You don't know how much of that's going to get eaten up. You know, another potentially maybe a three or four million dollars of that could could potentially go towards uh, T.J. Watt's new deal. And yes, we still think, at least I do, a T.J. Watt deal is going to get done. I know it hasn't got done yet. You're still uh, firmly in belief that it'll get done, correct? Correct. At what point? Would you start getting nervous about it next Monday? What's kind of the, the <laughs> when they get on the plane? When they get on the plane, if, okay. they, if they get on the plane and it hadn't happened, then it's time to worry. All right, fair enough. Uh, but I I think that's going to go down here sooner rather than later. Uh, so s- nearly 16 million. We'll see how much of that goes toward uh, 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 toward uh, what. Uh, you also have the practice squad that's going to get set. That's going to be around $3 million that you got to uh, set aside for that. And then the whole, how much will this team keep in reserves? You know, I mm-hmm. I have budgeted, and I, I kind of thought, you know, uh, uh, very, you know, uh, leaning, leaning, very conservative here at $7 million. I am convinced that number is going to be higher than that, but let's say they just need $7 million uh, in reserves for in season. You add in the $3 million uh, for, for the practice squad. Uh, that's, that's 10 million right there. So that takes you down to almost $6 million in, in you know, effective usable cap space there. How much of that's going to go to what, you know, uh, yeah. is the big question there. Long story short, this team has, should have cap money to do something with here if they need to go out and get uh, uh, a Carl Joseph or an elder or an offensive lineman here. Uh, would you be surprised if they trade for anybody at this point? And if so, who, what would that look like? Yes, I would be because I don't know who after cuts were made and they just don't have assets to give up unless they get super creative about it, which they could, but it doesn't seem likely at this point right and if they did what posi- what would that position look like it would obviously secondary. It could be secondary secondary or 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 maybe a tackle i i suppose but even then i would be surprised i think from where i sit right now i'll be surprised if they trade for anybody of sub i'll, I'll put it to you this way anybody that has a considerable salary mm-hmm. yeah you know? for sure but uh, i think just even in general i don't, I don't think they're trading because usually if a trade was going to happen it was going to happen by now right uh, so, uh, we'll, we'll keep our eyes peeled out for that, but that's where they sit salary cap wise now ahead of the practice squad being set. And we'll see, uh, I will update all that information as soon as all that comes in. All right. Chris Warren writes in, I like Mike. He says, Hey guys, I try my best not to criticize the team for making certain player personnel moves with the understanding that I can't possibly know what, what Kevin Colbert's ultimate plan is. But I really struggled, uh, uh originally when, the, uh, when the Steelers let Mike Kelton walk, the guy has a unique skill set of skills he's aggressive in coverage incredible against the run and phenomenal blood sir plus he has great attitude he is experienced and really sets the tone with his toughness not to mention we already have one less goon uh, having lost vince williams from the beginning i felt like uh, we could have fixed or we could have lived without Eric Ebron even before drafting Firemouth, and we've already uh, demonstrated how creative we can be when we really want to retain a player and need to address certain needs, but why the hell didn't the Steelers do that with Hilton? I just don't feel like we had much of a plan at all. Do you guys agree, or am I being too hard on Colbert? Look, I mean, uh, you look at this thing in a rearview mirror and the way it all played out right now, it's hard not to go back, and and I put it on you know Twitter a couple of days ago. You know who'd look real good in the Steelers uniform mm-hmm. right now is Mike Hilton. You and I have talked about that since there. Uh, did 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 this thing maybe go off the rails and go in a different way than what 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 Kevin Colbert thought it might uh, do originally? I think it's I think that's a possible yes. Uh, on the flip side, looking back on it now, though, that contract that that Mike Hilton signed with with the Bengals, and and knowing that the Steelers have not been afraid to use the voidable years, I mean, if you like the guy that much, and you know, you could have made that work. I think so. Is it is it okay to criticize 
how all this went down and, and, and Mike Kelton being on the Bengals as opposed to, to in a Steelers uniform now. Yeah, I get it. I, I, I think it's okay to do that. Uh, however, comma, I think some things went different ways than what maybe Kevin Colbert originally maybe planned would, would, would go. I mean, what what went different, though? I mean, they had to have known that Stephen Olsen was going to be on the chopping block, even though we didn't. They had to have had that planned at the start of the offseason, knowing what the cap number was. Well, the be. whole DeCastro thing, for starters, that's, that's, well, a, yeah, that's, but, a, I mean, that's, that's a chunk. That was, sure, but even before, I mean, all those Hilton stuff was made before, you know, all the DeCastro stuff. Can yeah, go ahead? I mean, I, you know, they just had to make a decision early before free agency hit, you know, for starters. So right, I mean, they did decide, you know, they want – you know, Sutton or Hilton, and they chose Sutton. Now, granted, he was a little bit cheaper than Hilton, but, I mean, I, I was fine with them choosing Sutton over Hilton, I guess, but they just get all, like, up in arms about, we got to find a slot corner who can blitz and be physical. It's like, well, man, if you were, if you, if you value that if you value that so much and so highly, then just why didn't you just keep Hilton in the first place? It just it just seemed weird to me. Uh, I, I mean, look, you ain't, you ain't, you ain't, you ain't got to, you know, twist my arm here. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I think we both agree that, that that's a tough loss, and we'll see if they're they're, they're able to overcome it or not. Yeah, and uh, I see Drew Rosen now still uh, talking about Joe has never been an undrafted or an unrestricted free agent before, and he's excited about this opportunity. We expect him to have a very strong market. So, I mean, listen, Hayden wanted the extension. The Steelers said, we're not giving it to you. So now Rosenhaus is trying to spin this as, you know, sure. Hayden's going to hit the market then. And, you know, we'll just, we'll, 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 we'll just take our ball and go home kind of thing. So, I mean, that's the way this thing's getting spun here by, by Rosenhaus, which is his job to do. Right. Look, I mean, this, uh, uh, you know, how else is he going to spin this? Uh, uh, Hayden said he wanted to, you know, wanted to end his career uh, in Pittsburgh. Uh, understandable. Wanted to, wanted to see about a contract extension. Uh, they didn't get it, uh, and it's not surprising considering his age and all like that uh, either. That, you know, on on top of it there. So yeah, look, I mean, uh, uh, that's that's why Drew Rosenhaus is Drew Rosenhaus. Yeah, I mean, this is just some posturing. I'm sure Hayden will want to try to get an extension or, or contract done in, in the off season with Pittsburgh. We'll see how this this year goes. But obviously, Rosenhaus is trying to play the card of well, if you don't want to give us the extension now, we'll just uh, go somewhere else next season and uh, maybe try to make the Steelers look bad here. But uh, you know, I don't think that's going to be it's not going to work the way that Rosenhaus is maybe trying to make it work. No, and 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 the Steelers will look at it at you know uh, after the off season and and see if they can fit it in or not. I I won't be surprised if this is Joe Hayden's last season in Pittsburgh though. I'm with you. That's been my expectation. We'll see how this year goes. Things can and will change, and the cap will go up, so there might be more flexibility. But um, I'm treating it like this very well could be his last season in Pittsburgh. All right, let's see what else we have in the email machine here. Uh, we have. Uh... Uh, let's see if I can find something here. Like your Gerald writes, I'd like your opinion on how the Steelers defense have changed throughout the years. I know they have remained a base 3-4 defense for a while now, but today's defense is basically a four-man front that's now a one-gap instead of the uh, days when it was two-gap uh, defense. Uh, thanks for the time. Uh, yeah, Gerald, I, mean, I think you hit on it. I mean, the, e even though at, at its core it's a 3-4 it's a, it's a, it's a base you know the uh, the usage of, of base has gone down throughout the years, and you know one of the the, the most significant things I think after after, after Dick LeBeau left was that uh, this uh, up front this team did become uh, more of a, a a one gap penetrating up front as opposed to hold the guy up and let the let the line you know wait till the wait till the linebackers get there uh, mm -hmm. now and then also I think uh, you know you see a lot more man now than you used to when you when you used to see a lot of zone. Yeah, yeah, the, the scheme has changed pretty drastically. You don't see as many fire zones. You you see a lot more man coverage. You see a lot more you know aggressive one gapping. Um, you definitely obviously we, we say base still as a three four, but they're in sub package much more than they still are um, in 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 their actual base three four. You got you know defensive linemen, their defensive ends that are playing inside. You got outside linebackers with their hand down. They don't drop into coverage as much. So yeah, I mean this defense has changed quite a bit over the last decade. All right, uh, Richard writes in, uh, the Steelers placed Dobbs on the injured reserve list. Will he be eligible to return to the active roster since he was never on the 53-man roster? No, he will not. Uh, uh, we already touched on that, Richard, I think, earlier in the show for you there. So hopefully that conversation, uh, you, you you were able to uh, uh, garner a lot of, of, of information from there. Uh, he would, at this point, if he wants to play for the Steelers or end up or has hope to play for the Steelers, uh, he's going to have to get off that IR and become a free agent first. 
and then re-sign uh, that way. Uh, the fact that he was not on the 53-man roster and then moved to IR eliminates his ability to come back as a uh, return player right now. So they would have to release him from IR and then him circle back somehow that way if he wants to play for the Steelers. Yeah, have to take the Brooks route. He cannot. He's not going to be a, a, a eligible to return guy the way that hypothetically a Stephon Tewitt or Marcus Allen or someone could be if they go to IR the next you know day or so. All right, uh, Alex Campbell writes in. Whatever happened with Henry Mondo? I feel like he was uh, in the mix of playing time right along with Bugs and Davis last season, but now seems to be mostly out of the running for a roster spot. Uh, and this was from a day ago. Uh, has there been anything in particular that has happened between last season and now that has caused his value to drop? What are the odds he edges out Bugs and Davis and grabs the sixth D line spot? I'm not saying I love the guy, but I just have a funny feeling with the Steelers may like him more than people think. Think. Keep up all, uh, the awesome work. Uh, you guys were at rock. Well, Alex, uh, you know, obviously this came in on the 31st at 6.50 a.m. So it was ahead of the uh, the roster, obviously, being set. Uh, there you go. Uh, you know, I, I think you see what uh, the, the, the team thinks of Henry Mondo and keeping him. Uh, I do think, though, that both Carlos Davis and Isaiah Bugs are better op- options uh, instead of him, as far as an uh, as far as the defensive lineman goes, uh, all around defensive lineman. But you know we have seen Mondo do stuff and and, and on special teams and uh, I mean, he's had his he had his moments during the preseason. I thought uh, uh, positive moments, didn't he? He's a tremendous athlete for a big guy. He moves really fluidly and and you know he was a, a running back, tight end a fullback in high school and you kind of see some of those traits on display to me it was never that he had a, a loss in value where his player regressed it was just that the, the room got so competitive with bugs playing better davis in the second year of the, the the acquisition the trading up for isaiah ladderbook it just became a really deep room so it was tough to justify him beating out those guys and obviously he was kept as the presumably eighth defensive lineman we'll see if he stays probably will at this point i mean if two goes to ir but um it was to me not that i was being critical of mondo it was just the group around him got really doubted in a, in a hurry. Yeah, so I mean they they liked him enough to 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 make him to keep him on the 53 at least initially here. So the, I I I think that speaks for something uh Alex Campbell, thank you for the email. One final one here uh from uh Bryce writes in uh, Alex, I agree with your latest roster prediction when it comes to Isaiah Bugs. I think he did a lot of good things in a game last year against Baltimore, and there's a lot to work with there. He's not scared of the big moment. Hopefully he can get more consistent with his work ethic and football IQ. Uh, with the with the situation, with the Tuit situation, what it is, I think Bugs is making the roster. Uh, he obviously sent this in before uh, the uh, uh, the roster was set. So, yeah, look, I mean, uh, Bugs, Davis, and Mundo. You know, we, we talked about what a, what a tough decision this team was going to have with some defensive linemen and, you know, the eight that they have right now, that's just not a bad eight to have. I, you know, obviously it's not going to stay eight on the 53. I don't think for much longer, but, uh, uh, not a bad group at, at, at all to have there. Uh, his second question is something that hasn't been talked about a lot on Steeders Depot is Tom Donahoe. Uh, he set a lot of the groundwork for the Steeders we see today. Can you guys talk about what you're, thought his general philosophy on players was and the job he did putting together rosters. Also, what ultimately sealed his fate with the organization? A general philosophy on players. Jeez, I mean, I, I don't I don't I don't know how to how to answer that because I mean that that pre pre internet media coverage time reading it out of the papers after the fact kind of thing there. It's not like not a lot. Not like I was able to garner a lot of information in 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 real time when it came to Donahoe to 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 speak on uh, ability to build an you know an organization you know philosoph- general philosophy on players. Yeah, I mean that was before I started to really follow this stuff super closely, so I don't really have any sort of answer in that regard. To the second part of the question about you know how did things end. Um, Bill Cower talks about that in his book that he released this summer. I forget exactly, you know, what exactly Cower had written, but I think basically the idea was just that, you know, there was just some micromanaging going on and some second guessing and just, you know, the, the relationship turned sour really fast and they tried to salvage it and tried to work it out, but they couldn't. And so it became, you know, Cower or him and, and Cower obviously won that power struggle. So, um, that was the idea of how things ended, um, in terms of how they ran it though. 
I don't have a, a great answer for you. Yeah, look, there's been a few. I mean, even going back in, in in the annals and the old papers and all, you know, several articles on 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 Donahoe versus Cower after that six and whatever season, I think, uh, mm-hmm. specifically. But uh, there was a bit of a power struggle between those two guys. I think Donahoe wasn't. <sighs> I think he was saying some things to the media behind Cowher's back that 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 didn't help as well too, and and it just it was just uh they didn't work well together, especially in the later years there. And I think it came to a uh, uh, I think both even offered to resignations or whatnot uh, at, at at some point there, and you know I think Rooney ended uh, uh Dan Rooney ended up looking at a situation and probably deciding on himself who probably needed to go. Uh, mm-hmm. in, in, you know, in, in that situation there. So, uh, yeah, th- his downfall, I think, is that, you know, he wanted probably, you know, just a power struggle more than anything. As far as the other, I mean, I, I don't know how to answer that question because, I, I you know, uh, he says uh, he set a lot of groundwork. Can you guys talk about what you thought his general philosophy on players was and, and the job he did putting together rosters? I mean, that's... I don't know how to answer that question. I mean, I think it was just the same philosophy that Rooney said was building from within, building through the draft, not so much on free agency and developing talent that way. I think that's just kind of been the hallmark of this team since even, you know, free agency became a thing back in the, what, you know, early mid nineties. Yeah. It feels like he wants to, uh, uh, the way Bryce phrases this, it feels like this is almost a gotcha moment or something, a gotcha email or whatnot uh, here. It feels like he wants to say something but wants us to comment so he can come back after the fact, if that makes sense there. I, I don't know what he's trying to get out here because it's kind of v- vague overall. Uh, we, I get the uh, what he uh, – the ultimate – uh, the ultimately sealed his fate with the organization. Yeah, I, I, I think I, Alex uh, uh, put that in proper terms, especially what Cower wrote in his book there as well, too, there. So I don't know, Bryce, maybe you could be more specific there other than just general philosophy on players, but uh, it, it's hard to tell this much after the fact here. Yeah, that was a question I did not expect to get, but but it's nice to see a different type of question in there. So appreciate that. Uh, let's see if I got any more. I think that's got uh, the the I uh, got most of it there, uh, Alex. There. So uh, within that, uh, let's see. We will get back after it on Friday, right? And who knows what we're going to be talking about? Probably a different uh, different fifty three man roster uh, at, at that point. There, we'll talk about the practice squad and uh, who knows, maybe a what contract extension will, mm. will have happened uh, as well by then. So in the meantime, you can follow me on Twitter at Steelers Depot. Follow Alex on Twitter at Alex underscore Kazora. Follow the show at Terrible Podcast. Email the show, theterriblepodcast at gmail.com. If you like what we do and you want to donate to the cause, go to SteedersDepot.com. Uh, hit the donate button up right navigational bar. Also, if you like an ad-free version of the site, go to the site. Hit ad-free. And for $25 for one calendar year, you can have an ad-free vers- version uh, of the site. Uh, so in the meantime, until Friday, as always, thanks for listening to the Terrible Podcast with Dave and Alex.